Welcome to the Hollywood and Toto podcast, the right take on entertainment. The hit cast offers a weekly look at Hollywood from a conservative point of view. Sick of media bias infecting Hollywood headlines? Tired of stars insulting your views? Hit has your back. Now, here's your host, Christian Toto. Welcome to episode 85 of the Hollywood and Toto podcast, The Right Take on Entertainment. This week, we're speaking with producer-director John Sullivan, a driving force behind the new movie Gosnell. It's a story the media wouldn't tell. Hollywood wouldn't either. So Sullivan's team worked around the system, and he got plenty of experience doing just that. This week's show is sponsored by Hollywood. Heck, it's as American as baseball, apple pie, and generic moon landings. Before my interview with John, I wanted to talk about flags. The big story this week in conservative film circles is the news that the upcoming Neil Armstrong movie First Man leaves out something critical. The American flag. You know, the one that Armstrong planted after landing on the moon? That one. The film star Ryan Gosling defended the decision not to have that flag in the movie in the most PC way possible. Shocking, right? Will it matter? I don't think so. I think a few moviegoers who have already said they'll do just this will avoid the movie based on the lack of a flag. That's their right. But the film itself is going to have a lot of firepower behind it. It's already got some serious Oscar season buzz, some early good reviews... And the film is made by the very talented director Damien Chazelle of La La Land fame. I think he's a really talented guy, and I'd line up to see anything he does. So I think from a marketing point of view, it will survive this little bump in the road. But the whole situation speaks to something else about Hollywood. This is the same industry that says how high when Chinese officials say jump. Studios scramble to appease Chinese censors time and time again. They include subplots that are favorable to Chinese moviegoers. It's just part of what goes on in Hollywood today. American sentiments, well, if they have to be stamped out, so be it. Now, what's funny, I think I thought about this and said, well, why? Why would you take out that flag? It's such a significant, significant moment in the history of space travel. I mean, this was a race between two countries to get to the moon. America won. That matters. It's part of the story and the narrative. Do they think that a flag would hurt the box office? Could it? Is it possible that someone, a European film goer, a Chinese film goer, would watch First Man and say, you know what? That movie was excellent. It was powerful, great performances. It really told a, a, a mesmerizing story. Boy, the sight of the American flag, I'm out. I'm going to tell everyone I know on social media not to see First Man. That's not likely. It does suggest the industry's subtle anti American bent at times, though. It made me think of that Superman reboot from a few years ago starring Brandon Routh. They took the classic Superman line, truth, justice, in the American way, and they took out something. I think you can figure out which word uh, got the the (laughs) editing treatment. And then I thought, well, you know, we are in the age of Trump. And maybe the first man crew said, we don't want this little blast of pro-American spirit in our movie. Is it possible? Gosh, anything's possible in the age of Trump. Hollywood hates him with such a passion. Who knows? That could be partly responsible, maybe not connected at all, but certainly crosses your mind. Either way, this whole situation just really speaks ill of modern storytellers, their backbones, or the lack thereof. Don't touch that dial. You're listening to my daddy's podcast. Now here's the hit tweet of the week. Ah, oh, he's back. Ron Perlman couldn't stay away too long, could he? And since every liberal on the planet is currently weaponizing Senator John McCain's funeral against the president, how could Perlman stand down? Here you go. VP Penis is speaking at Senator McCain's funeral. Not a wet eye in the place, because his words, like his heart, are as empty as his suit. It's a quick editor's note. Perlman spelled penis wrong. You're listening to the Hollywood in Toto podcast, the right take on entertainment. My hit tip of the week is Hostiles. 
This late 2017 entry was meant to crash the award season, and then critics didn't take the bait. Didn't really get much of attention at all. Some positive reviews for sure, but certainly not in the discussion for serious awards. That's a shame, because it's a really potent film. It's a Western, yes, it's got some modern sensibilities, and that can be frustrating, sort of a politically correct spin, or at least through the lens of what a filmmaker today would say of the past, but there's great performances here, and also there's a lot of tension, too. Christian Bale plays an army captain forced to transport a, a dying Native American chief to his homeland. Now, these two players used to be at odds with each other. They were at war with each other, but now... The army wants this particular chief to go home to die amongst his fans and fr- family and friends. Of course, these two characters clash at first, or at least are uneasy. And then violence erupts. You know it's a Western, so that's never going to be too far around the bend. Also making things more interesting, Rosamund Pike has a pretty significant role here. She plays a woman with a really troubled past. She's trying to bounce back from it. And she really adds a new layer of complication to the story. She's a great actress, so anytime you add her to the cast... Things will get better. Now, Hostels does take its sweet time telling the story. Be patient. Hang in there. It's slow at times. Absolutely can't defend that part of the story, but it is working towards something, and I think the resolution is really powerful. Hostels is available right now on Netflix. Now, let's get to this week's HitCast interview. This is John Sullivan's second time on the show. But he's back for a pretty good reason. Four years ago, the crowdfunding campaign for the Gosnell Film Project shattered records. It's been a long journey since then, but the film is finally ready, and it's going to be hitting theaters nationwide October 12th. The story of abortionist Dr. Kermit Gosnell is one that demands to be told. The movie itself is gripping for all the right reasons. It'll make you question how this horror story went on for so very long. So many institutions failed us, from the media to the police departments of, of, in the greater Philadelphia area. It's just an absolute calamity that this went on for so long. It is shocking. And also, it's PG-13, so even though it's a real horror story, you don't have to look away too much. I think it's a pretty smart decision that we'll get into a little bit with John. Now, John served as the producer, and he also was a marketer on the film. He's got a great sense of how the market works, how conservative-leaning films can have a real impact at the box office. There are very few people that I know who get Hollywood better from a right-of-center perspective than John. Even better now, the film is like a who's who of Hollywood's small but very talented conservative contingent. You've got the great Nick Searcy. He's the director. He's also a co-star. The screenplay was written by Andrew Claven, a great podcaster, terrific author, and a former hit cast guest. Dean Cain plays the detective who helps crack the case. Now, I've seen Gosnell the movie, and it doesn't disappoint. Now I'm going to give you a sneak peek of the film and also why Hollywood is so resistant to conservative stories. This might surprise you. Here's my latest chat with John Sullivan. John, thank you for joining the HitCast once more. This is your second time around, and obviously I want to talk about the new movie, Gosnell. You know, let's put ideology aside, let's put faith aside. This is an amazing story. It seems tailor-made for the big screen and I'm not surprised that you're attached to it, but what are the complications with this, not even so much the distribution and sort of the resistance potentially, but sometimes great stories don't always translate, and sometimes they're they're more challenging than you think. So when you, when you first get attached to the movie, what was your creative concern or what obstacle you thought might be in the way, even though it seems like a slam dunk story? Well, I think the first thing you said, actually, ideology, uh, you know, we didn't want to make an ideological movie. I think that ruined story. So for us, it was really about telling the story and trying to get the ideology or whatever your kind of feelings around the subject was out of that so that we could just tell the story because it was so compelling from the beginning. So for that, that was the biggest challenge, I'd say, and biggest hurdle right at the beginning. And, uh, you know, I think we did a pretty good job with it. We really tried that. Um, the other thing is just the subject matter, right? I mean, we are talking about abortion. We're talking about children. But we went out of our way to make sure it wasn't gory or bloody or anything like that so that, you know, it's really accessible to people to see the story of it going on mm-hmm. rather than kind of being in a horror film or worried about that. So, you know, my, my 13-year-old daughters have seen the movie um, you know, it is a mature subject matter, but it, at the same time, it's one that I think is important. And, you know, 
we need to know that these people exist out in the world. I think um, no matter what your position is on on abortion or any of this stuff, you know, <clears throat> that's what I think with, with this is, is, you know, the gosnells of the world exist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we want to shine a light on that. When you think about the ideology and, and keeping it less ideological, is there sort of a maybe behind the scenes checks and balances system where you or the director, Nick Searcy, or I mean, how do you kind of maintain that when, you know, it's it's almost, you know, we conservatives often joke about liberals that they're in a bubble and they don't see what we see. I mean, if I was gathering with like-minded people who were dedicated to making this story come to life, there's the possibility that maybe we get blinders. So from your perspective, how do you, as a producer, as someone intimately involved with this project, how do you kind of make sure that you, you stay on the straight and narrow, for lack of a better phrase? Well, I think first is you have a, a commitment to the truth. And, you know, the, the, that truth is often more interesting than fiction. So, you know, there wasn't a there wasn't things that need to be invented or anything like that. There was some compression that needed to be done of characters, some time frames, just because you're putting this into a 90 minute format. But really, we had a very conscious effort through the whole team not to kind of try to insert anything. You know, we pulled from the grand jury transcripts. We pulled from the court transcripts. You know, for us, it was all about just getting the story that had happened on camera. And there were things actually, Christian, that we were like, this is too crazy. People aren't going to believe this, that it's true. They're going to think we have, you know, invented this or something. But, you know, uh, I'll, I'll give a little Easter egg away at the end of the film and the credits. You know, we we show a lot of the uh, evidence photos, a lot of the actual footage that was taken by the police, um, you know, that was put into the public record. So, you know, we really, really tried to stay true to the story, true to the transcripts, true to the interviews. Um, you know, we had the access to both uh, the real Woody, the James Woods character played by Dean Cain um, and the uh, prosecutor, uh, Christine Wexler, were both on set with us. So that helped, too, of, of knowing exactly what we were doing. And, hey, does this look like what happened when you guys were there or and stuff? So we really, really tried just to keep it uh, on the straight and narrow, just telling the story as it happened. Mm -hmm. The media famously did little to cover the Gosnell trial, and uh, there's a point in this film, your film, that shows that. It, it's it's kind of quick, but it leaves a mark. Uh, do you expect that the movie itself may get similar treatment from Hollywood press critics? Do you think they're – I mean, are you anticipating that? Or, or I know this is a little bit kind of a crystal ball question, but uh, it, it almost seems like it would be – uh, like a companion said, if the movie doesn't get a lot of press, whereas the the crime didn't get a lot of press. Yeah, I, I think initially they'll try to ignore the film uh, just simply because they ignored the trial. Um, and again, I don't think they'll feel compelled. I don't think most media outlets will feel compelled to cover it um, because they didn't cover the trial. Um, not until kind of they're shamed into it. Um, by people saying, why aren't you covering this? And, you know, it was really Kristen Powers' USA Today story that broke that open and, uh, you know, she said, why is this trial not getting, you know, coverage on uh, every single TV station around the country right now? Um, but I think, you know, if we do well at the box office, uh, it'll get some attention. I think then it'll be hard to ignore it that way. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think sometimes, you know, the, the media wants to put its head in the sand on this stuff. Um, they don't want to admit it because of the ideology, the political nature of it. Um, but you know, if we do a good job marketing it and people come out and see it, I think, you know, they'll be forced to, to cover it. There's a, a, there's, there's so much to talk about, about the film, but one thing jumped out at me kind of mid movie was we, we talk about a lot of, about today, the sort of the, the breakdown of institutions, you look at the press and, and, and how they've gone awry when you think about the government and you look at the FBI, it, it just seems like a lot of what we're seeing in life now in, in our country is a breakdown of things that we used to trust. And I felt that your movie, it's sort of an, an undercurrent. The, you know, uh, the, the people filing dozens and dozens of complaints about Gosnell and, and nothing happening. It, can you talk a little bit about that? It was, was that intentional? I mean, it just seems like... There's the obvious corruption and the obvious horrors, but I, I thought that this was almost equally mesmerizing in a way. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think we're stepping into a situation that a Gosnell was a, a, a microcosm. And so I don't think we were looking to insert that into the film. It was naturally there. And specifically, 
you know, the clinic wasn't inspected for like 17 years, I believe it was. Um, you know, where a nail clinic in Philadelphia has to be inspected every single year. So here you have a clinic uh, that's supposedly a medical clinic, and it's not inspected, even though, as you mentioned, there's dozens and dozens of complaints. And so that was true. That wasn't something that, you know, we kind of stepped in and said, oh, in 2018, all this stuff's going to happen. So I, again, I think it, it. this was like, you know, again, this was happening, you know, over the last almost two decades. And so I think it's a microcosm of, of this happening. And it just we see it now on a national level. You know, as you mentioned, we see the breakdown of the press. The press didn't cover the story. We see the breakdown of the government and the, the controls that are supposed to be there to protect us and protect these women and protect these children. And they weren't there. Um, you know, so we're seeing this along the way, the institutions and this breakdown. And the problem with the Gosnell one is this wasn't a case of you know, oh, we're, uh, it was intentional. Let me put it that way. I mean, I believe that it was fully intentional that they just looked the other way. And in fact, we have the line in there, you know, this came directly from Governor Ridge's office. And that's exactly what was said um, in the grand jury investigation. And, uh, you know, so you have it coming all the way down from a Republican governor not to go do this. Um, so this isn't even like a, a Democrat issue. It's a, a both sides issue. Um, on any sort of topic. And the people who lose at the end uh, are, the, are the little people, uh, you know, the, the common Main Street folks, you know, the ones we're supposed to be protecting. They're the ones that are getting caught, caught in the tra- traps here. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Earl Billings, who plays uh, Dr. Kermit Gosnell. It's, you know, I, I think there's so many ways to portray uh, evil on, on screen. And I was mesmerized by him, particularly in the early sequences kind of a folksy, distracted, oddly charming character, and absolutely not what I expected when I turned the movie on. When I started watching it, I had a screening link. It, talk about that that particular angle, and, and maybe that's the way he was, and that's you just depicted it that way, but I just, from as a producer point of view, I, I was just curious, how would you, how would you describe him? It was, it was, I was just taken so aback by it, and I was so, I was chilled by, by what I saw on screen. Well, uh, we had some conversations with Earl early on and how, how are we going to play this? And, you know, Hannah Arendt, the uh, uh, philosopher, has a very good uh, writing, you know, about the Nazis. And it was, you know, this big thing came out about it called the banality of evil. And uh, it wasn't that they were some sort of like Dr. Evil character or James Bond villain in the background. It was the fact that these were normal, ordinary people and they did such horrendous things. And same thing with Gosnell. I mean, Gosnell was like up for like citizen of Philadelphia, like I think three times or like in their neighborhood. And uh, so, you know, he he was a guy who, you know, he, he thought he was doing the right thing in the strangest of ways. So he really did have that kind of folksiness. And then Earl just really said, you know. I'm going to play this guy. You know, I can't play him like a villain. I've got to play him, uh, you know, in, in this kind of way of him believing he's doing the right thing. And uh, he comes across that way. And then you also see the change of the character in a couple scenes, um, you know, that way. You know, Ann and Phelan, the other producers, went and met with him for over two hours in prison. And uh, Gosnell uh, was, you know, when they met with him, he was he was training for a triathlon. Uh, when because when he gets out of jail, even though he's serving three life consecutive sentences, when the the public really realizes you know who he is and what he did, and that he's going to be vindicated, so he's training for a triathlon. Uh, that's the mentality of the man. Um, you know, I don't think he saw what he did as wrong or evil or anything of that nature. So it, it's a very complex character, and I think you know Earl really brought the goods in the acting side, and uh, we were all extremely pleased seeing him play that on screen and and like you said it's haunting it's chilling really to see the way he plays it yeah it's great great creative choices absolutely we're talking with john sullivan the producer and marketing director for gosnell directed by nick searcy starring dean kane you know i think that critics are going to pounce on this movie for what they're going to see as the exaggerations the the outlandish material here and and as i know um um and 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 film often do they just take it right from the the source material uh is there a plan to counter that because i if if i didn't if i walked into this movie without much background i would say oh this this is absurd this couldn't be happening is there is there a a, a, a sort of a counterattack plan for that kind of reaction uh yeah i think the first counterattack is actually in the movie itself um is within the credits uh you know we we 
include a lot of the evidence photos, a lot of the video that was taken on the raids uh, when they arrested Gosnell. Um, so you see it, you know, um, I, you know, we're planning to put together like a fact sheet. I've had to do this with other films uh, because, you know, there, and like I said, we, we pulled back. I mean, there, there were other outrageous stories um, that we heard about Gosnell and that were verified. It just seemed like, gosh, you, you can't put this in because it just seems so bizarre and like it's so uh, untrue. But I mean, you know, one thing <laughs> we didn't put in the movie was that he had a massive collection of uh, va- uh, vagina photos. And, uh, you know, it's just like we didn't put that in the movie. Um, but they, he had been taking pictures of his patients and uh, it was a bizarre thing. And he claimed it was research, even though there was nothing there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we left that out of the movie because it was so bizarre. Uh, but, yeah, we are kind of uh, have a plan to kind of counter that because, you know, there are some scenes you're going, this could not be happening. And it did happen. Uh, it happened 100 percent that way. You know, another scene we planned to shoot at one point in time was, you know, he was using the uh, quote unquote medical waste, which were the children uh, out at his uh, beach house. It appeared uh, the police thought he was using that for crab bait. Uh, you know, we don't have that in the movie, uh, but that's the level of the mentality of this guy. And that's the absurdity of what he would do. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we do have a plan to kind of counteract if somebody wants to come in and say, oh, that didn't happen and that didn't happen. You know, be our guest. We've got all the uh, tr- court transcripts. We've got the interviews with the DA. We've got the interviews with the detectives. Um, you know, we, we know what happened and we've shown it on screen and there's nothing on film that's exaggerated in one w- way, shape or another. Wow. I, I, I feel chilled just hearing this description. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the, um, I guess, two of the people who are really driving forces here, uh, fellow McAleer and Ann McElhaney. I think a lot of conservatives say we need to engage the pop culture audience. We need to make art. We need to kind of counter what the left is doing. That's what they do 24-7. Talk a little bit about them as a creative couple and, and what's, the, what's their secret sauce? I mean, I, it, I'm, I'm amazed at what they do, how they spread the word, how they focus in on subjects and their approach. I, I, I mean, I, I, I can't help but applaud them. And I'm just kind of curious, having worked with them on this project, what's your takeaway? Yeah, uh, it's funny. I, I first met them uh, right before uh, Dinesh D'Souza took the stage at CPAC in 2012 uh, and spoke, uh, you know, I, I think right after Dinesh. Uh, it's not on the video. He spoke right after Bobby Jindal, and he has this funny quote where he says, you know, welcome to uh, uh, American Indian or uh, Indian American uh, CPAC day. <laughs> uh, but uh, we've met them backstage. It was the first time I met them. We've stayed in touch, uh, watched what they had done uh, and, uh, you know, kind of shared a, a common, you know, uh, vision for engaging culture on these issues and uh, starting discussions. And, uh, you know, the, the two things I see about Anne and Phelan is uh, it comes out of their journalistic background. Uh, you know, they are journalists. That's who they are by trade. Um, you know, and they've covered murder trials. They've covered bombings. You know, they're from Ireland. So they're used to controversy and things like that. The other thing is they're fearless. They will absolutely walk into anything and uh, question, you know, the authority. And I think that's part of the Irish in them. Um, you know, uh, that they just, the Irish love to question authority. Uh, so that's, that's part of it. But then, you know, Phelan and Anne are both fearless to, to go in. And I think they have the sensibilities of understanding what's commercial. You know, they, they understand, um, the commerciality of something, not just the ideological need for it. Mm -hmm. So I think you blend all those things in them and they, they really are able to kind of trigger stuff and, uh, you know, make stuff happen in that way. And, you know, it's been a long journey and I've really enjoyed working with them. Um, you know, uh, I worked with them for the last four years on this project and, uh, I'm so proud of the whole team and bringing it together. And it's been a real pleasure working with them. They're they amazing people. And I actually heard Ann McElhaney speak, gosh, it might've been four or five years ago and I was mesmerized. I said, who is this person? I want to hear more about her. So I'm not surprised to, uh, to find out what she's been up to. Uh, another project you're working on is the No Safe Spaces movie with Dennis Prager, Adam Carolla, kind of a cast of kind of a who's who of who really matters today in cultural conversations. Can you give us an update on as far as possible release date, uh, what you've caught on camera without giving away too much? I- I'm just eager to share as much as I can about it and can't wait to see it. Yeah, it's been a, a, 
a fun project to work on with uh, Adam and Dennis and, and the team on that one. And uh, yeah, you know, we're dealing with the intellectual dark web, I think is what it's known as now. You know, we've got the uh, Dave Rubens, Jordan Petersons of the world uh, in the film, along with Van Jones. Uh, and I think what people have to understand about this issue is it's not a I don't even think it's a right left issue, uh, Christian. I think it's an up down issue. I think what we're seeing is an attack on something that has been so special and we haven't understood the, the specialness of it, which is the, uh, the individual, you know, from the enlightenment, um, you know, before that, you know, we were ruled by Kings and monarchs and the rule of law didn't allow the individual to have rights. And we're kind of seeing a reversal of that. We're seeing this new tribalism happen and, uh, no safe spaces really takes that on front on. And the place we see it the most right now is, you know, on free speech on college campuses. Uh, but what we're really seeing is this bleeds over everywhere. We kind of have a, a saying within the team is, you know, what happens on campus doesn't stay on campus. You know, we're seeing this at Google. We're seeing this at Facebook. Um, we're seeing this in the mainstream media um, across the lines. And and it may seem fine for folks who are on the left right now because it's happening to conservatives. But, you know, it could go the other way, too. Um, and, and that's the thing we want to protect is that this is a fundamental right of an individual, that the right to conscience and to speak that conscience. And if we lose that, we lose something very, very special. And, uh, you know, we've seen Jordan Peterson fight this up in, in Canada where there's com uh, compulsory speech laws now saying you have to attach the pronoun to the person uh, that they agree with. Uh, well, you know, currently in that's like 39 or 40 different versions of that. Mm -hmm. If you do something wrong, you can be suddenly, you know, saying, well, thank you, ma'am. You can suddenly be thrown in jail or fined for that, uh, you know, rather than, you know, calling them a Z or a Z or whatever. Um, so it's fighting these compulsory speech laws that are happening, fighting these censor laws that are happening. And it's really educating, I think, a younger generation, which doesn't understand the gift that they've been given um, in, in this free speech. And that, you know, just because you don't agree with somebody doesn't mean you get to shut them up um, in, in that sense. And uh, so it's we've got people on the right and the left in this movie. It's it's not something that's politically uh, bound. It's something we're really looking at and saying, you know, we need to protect the individual. And uh, Adam and Dennis are great about that. You know, and these are two guys that have, as Adam will say, nothing in common but common sense. And uh, I think it really shows in the movie. I have to disagree with you slightly. I think it's already bleeding into – uh, liberals, sort of people on the left getting attacked. I, I think about Amy Schumer's last two films. I mean, Snatched was attacked because the villains were not the appropriate villains, and then I Feel Pretty, her new film, was attacked because it was called fat shaming, that, you know, heaven forbid, a, a person of, of medium size fantasize about being like a supermodel thin. And so I, I think it's I think it's happening already, and I, I, the fact that the Amy Schumer's aren't fighting back is, is kind of sad. I, I One last question, you know, the, some you know we you and I have talked about it on and on on and off air about what conservatives face in Hollywood. Is are you optimistic that either things are changing or that there are different routes that people right of center can take to kind of, I guess, uh, circumvent the system? What's your sort of general sense of, of where we stand now as a culture? Well, I mean, I think it's difficult to get something, you know, that's explicitly conservative through the Hollywood machinery. And I, I think just to kind of take a step back and, and explain for people how it works is, you know, you have a bunch of creative executives who really aren't tied to a bottom line. I think if they were tied to the bottom line, like you need to absolutely make money, um, you'd see a different situation. But that doesn't really happen too much. You, you I'm amazed how, how much people fail forward in this business, you know, that you'll see somebody who's responsible for a total bomb and suddenly they're promoted. Um, not to say there aren't competent people and there aren't good people, um, because I've encountered those, but I'm just saying as a general rule, um, in Hollywood, you have kind of a revolving door of creative executives that are making the choices for networks and studios and everything else. And I'll be very candid. They, they look at the rest of the country as a flyover country. They're embarrassed by, you know, the Trump voter, um, if you will. And, uh, I think it's a sad, I, I look at it as Hollywood is a very broken system, you know, um, particularly on the movie side, you know, 95% of the population opts out of your product every single week. You know, only even on the best weeks, only 5% of the country will go see your product. To me, that's a losing business model, you know, um, when you have that. And it's been on a decline for a long time. Now, 
that is, you know, there's other platforms to see movies and other things like that, that eat into that, that explain that. But there's also something going on here when you're not making movies for the audiences and they just tune out, that's the issue that's happening. And so for me, you know, I'm still, you know, I, I think I have that kind of up, upbeat, uh, glasses half full or, Maybe not even the glass is half full. I'm just glad there's a glass, you know, <laughs> if it's half full, half empty, whatever. I like but, uh, you know, and, and I'll go around the system. I mean, you know, we did that with Gosnell, right? Like we control the creative uh, elements of it. Uh, we use Hollywood as far as the releasing and, and distribution of it and the platforms. But you know what? We, we never trust the creative to them because, you know, we're going to get wrong. I was just with another very, very well-known reality TV star that wanted to do something that was very kind of biblically based. Um, and, uh, and they were told, well, we really want a skeptic on this to lead this. And I'm like, you have one of the best well-known reality stars in the world and you're turning them down because you want to take a position on this rather than just jump into that audience that has watched. I mean, 2 million people have watched their show every week for the last I don't know, seven, eight seasons. I didn't get that, you know, and uh, they didn't get it either. And so it does show me that the bias still exists and that they're, that's still going on. And, you know, the currency for this group is not like, hey, I need to do such a great job um, because the shareholder value for ABC or whatever is going to be phenomenal. It's really about what party am I going to get invited to? Uh, what are my friends going to think if I green light that, you know, new show? Uh, that, you know, actually had some Trump voters on it or had a different perspective than what all my friends have, uh, you know, but I am also at the same time, you see something like a last man standing coming back on uh, Fox. Uh, part of that was a business decision because Fox owned the uh, underlying IP and Disney didn't. Um, but even now with the merger, it's funny that it will be back. <laughs> it'll be an a, a Disney ABC uh, eventually owned thing. But uh, it's good to see that, that, you know, here's the number, I think, three comedy on all of television. And it was it was canceled. And I think part of it was ideolog ideological reasons and uh, part of it was business. But, uh, you know, it's good to see that back. I, I can't let you go with just I, one follow up question. You mentioned that a lot of the studios, the creative people pulling the strings, it sounds like they're protected from their bad decisions, economically speaking. Can you, I, This may be too long an answer, but is there a way you can kind of just briefly let the listener know how that works? Because you would think if a bomb is a bomb that there would be consequences, but it sounds like there are other sort of pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that protect them. Can Can you describe that? Yeah, I think part of it is it's the system, right? So you, you come in into a system and you start off as an assistant to an executive and then you work your way up that ladder. So what happens is, you know, you know, we'll just call it, you know, Acme Studios for lack of a, a better term. I and mean, we could call it Paramount or Warner Brothers or, you know, Sony, whatever we want to. But what happens within that is you know, you move up the ladder. And so then you become on that, you're on that corporate ladder and they don't like to go outside of that. I, I found that very strange, actually. Um, it's not a very entrepreneurial system uh, within ho Hollywood, to be very honest. Uh, they always think they're doing something new, but it's really a business that hasn't really changed in about a hundred years. Well, maybe 60 years since the uh, Howard Hughes case, mm -hmm. but it really hasn't changed. Um, and, you know, so these executives rise up from an assistant to then, you know, uh, a minor creative executive, then a senior creative executive, then a VP. And so they're in the system and they're not really held accountable. I mean, you've had studios lose big money and you haven't seen, you know, studio changeover. And part of it is like they believe I think they believe the system is more important um, and the executive can correct within the system and the system will correct for the executive. Um, but it, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't seem that way. Um, you know, and so again, you get people in there that are ignoring, in my opinion, let's take ideology off the table. Uh, it, the baby boomers are the number two film going audience, um, in the country. They're retired. They have money. They, they, they like movies. This is the generation that grew up on easy writer and jaws and star Wars, uh, you know, that brought this in. So they're not media adverse. It isn't like you're talking about some fundamentalist group or something, but they're not even making movies for them on a regular basis. And when they do, we see that they do very well, particularly for their production budget to box office, you know, exotic Mary gold hotel. You've seen a lot of stuff with, you know, like the intern with De Niro. Um, these things have done very well uh, compared to other dramatic box office uh, uh, theatrical movies. Um, so again, I just see it that, that, you know, a 27 year old creative executive doesn't want to make a, a, a movie for their grandparents or their parents. 
Um, and so they're just fundamentally ignoring these audiences. Also, the movies have changed quite a bit. You know, the independent movie world is very, very hard these days. Part of it also is, you know, look at when, you know, Marvel puts out a movie, you know, uh, if they break even at the box office, they're happy. I mean, because they're going to sell $400 million in bed sheets and action figures and, and, and you know, uh, Disneyland tickets and everything else. Um, I had a friend who was involved in the, the transaction with Marvel and Disney, and he's like, this is what this is about. You know, the movies could break even. They're just $250 million commercials yeah. um, to go on and sell other things. So the business itself is changing, right? So these tent poles have gone from a big blockbuster to a massive blockbuster where you're betting, you know, a quarter to a half a billion dollars um, once, time, once you put all the advertising and everything else into these things, um, you know, these corporations are betting. It's amazing. It's a great peek into the system. And uh, yeah, I can look at my kids' toothbrushes, which are e either Star Wars <laughs> or some sort of superhero to, to confirm your, what you're saying. Uh, John, thank you again for joining the HitCast for a second time. Please mark your calendar, calendars. Gosnell Hits Theater is October, sec uh, sorry, October 12th. And if you want to see a really engrossing film, one made outside the Hollywood system that everyone's going to be talking about, you couldn't have a better choice. Thank you, John, and we'll talk again soon. All right. Thanks, Christian. Well, thanks again for listening. Don't forget to check out HollywoodandToto.com for both the show notes and, of course, the latest entertainment news. Please follow me at Twitter at Hollywood and Toto. And we'd love it if you leave a podcast review over at iTunes. See you next week.